Um, so as the slide says, I'm a, is that there, right? yeah, okay. I'm a maker of many mistakes, um, just endless mistakes. And I had this great, um, this great talk planned out where I was going to tell you a story of a time I screwed up, and that could have been prevented by testing. And then I was going to go into telling you about how I go about testing and all the workflows I go through. And due to circumstances outside of my control, I found out yesterday I actually can't talk to you about any of those things. Um, so now I'm just going to tell you a couple of stories of times uh, that I screwed up <laughs> and uh, how they could have been prevented by testing. So this is basically just going to be, this is not, come on. There we go. So this is going to be story time, uh, this little afternoon story time here. So. Uh, the first story here, is this really not going to work for me? Is it off? Is that the problem? There we go. You got to turn it on. Pro tip for anyone presenting. So this story is called The Hammer of Tor. Um, show of hands, who's familiar with Tor? OK. For those of you not familiar, um, essentially it's a web browser that goes through a proxy service that kind of students like to use it in school situations to get around web filtering. Um, and that's what was happening in this school. They, the students figured out they could use Tor and they could get around all the school's content filtering. And you know, the school was kind of playing a cat and mouse game with, the, with these kids and saying, all right, well, we're going to take away their admin rights so they can't install anything. And the kids realized, well, all I have to do is put it on a thumb drive and pop it in and I can run it from the thumb drive. So eventually, the school said, well, you know what? We use Casper. And Casper has this thing called restricted software. So we're going to go ahead and use that. And we're going to you know, stop these kids from, from running Tor. Now, this was also back in the version 8 days. So, and I didn't have a version 8 JSS, so forgive me. My screenshot is of a current, uh, current JSS. But um, it's unclear as to exactly how this happened. But apparently, somehow, uh, they ended up putting in Tor with wildcards on either side. <laughs> and notice, notice here, you have some, some checkboxes here, like restrict exact process name and delete application. I don't know if you can see this, but the delete application checkbox, you cannot check anymore if restrict exact process name is not checked. I'm not going to say how or why that happened. <laughs> but we might uh, find out in a moment. So. Um, this is a very dangerous, dangerous feature. And it was even more dangerous in version 8, because version 8, for those of you who remember version 8, lacked scope on the restricted processes. So it was a global thing. There was no easy way to test your restricted processes. You were just applying them full scale to your entire deployment. So what happened with this school is, and this was actually a whole school district. It was like a, a lot of schools. It was a very big deployment. And what happened here is they had the wildcard in their search, and they had delete application checked. And it turns out the string TOR actually exists in a lot of places. <laughs> Things that are important to an OS X system, like directory services. Who would have thought you needed that? Um, and so they set this up and said, great, we're going to show those kids save. And who has a guess as to what happened? <laughs> Bad things. Yes. Bad things happened. Um, so it was actually a very interesting problem, because every machine was essentially bricked. The operating system was broken. The user data was all fine, all still there. So that was cool. But now it was tens of thousands of machines that needed to be re-imaged manually uh, that was a, a fun day, I'm sure, or a fun few days, um, more than likely. So, um, so I mentioned they didn't have scope when they, when they set this up in, in version 8. So a good way to go about testing these things, and something that I 
think is a very good idea and if I were to set up a testing environment would do, uh, I would set up a, sep a sec uh, separate JSS just for testing and roll a couple of machines, make my mistakes there so that when I break things, it doesn't affect my users, especially in a deployment that large. Um, now, of course, with scope, you can have a separate testing group within your primary JSS if you want, but I still like the idea of having that actual physical, logical separation between your development or your testing environment and your production environment because even with testing groups, I've made some mistakes that I would have cared not to make. So uh, I guess the moral of the story here is don't, uh, don't do that, um, whatever you do. So since, uh, since I found out yesterday that I couldn't do the entirety of this talk the way I wanted to, I was kind of scrambling for content, and uh, Rich Troughton was actually nice enough to tell a story of his own that uh, is hopefully a little less sad and disappointing than, I'm sorry, I should have given you like a heads up when this was happening, shouldn't I? <laughs> so hopefully this is a little less uh, sad than <laughs> some of the things I'm going to mention. So everybody, Rich Troughton. Thank you. So um, this is a story that uh, I've, I've probably told a few people over the years. Uh, but I never actually titled it until John said, hey, do you want a title for this story? And I thought about it and I said, how trust but verify ate my weekend. So this story is based on actual events. Um, some details have been changed to protect both myself and the innocent. Um, <laughs> once upon a time at a former gig, we ran a calendaring solution known as Meeting Maker. In the fullness of time, the organization switched from using, uh, you know, to using Exchange for their email and calendaring, and the word came down from on high that we needed to migrate the calendar data stored in Meeting Maker to the equivalent Exchange calendar. I don't know how many of you had to deal with Meeting Maker back in the day. Meeting Maker really didn't like for you to get the data out. So, after months of work, we were finally ready to go with this migration. Um, and I also gained a new appreciation for the, uh, the work that uh, people who develop calendar software do because there are lots of wrong ways to move calendar data around and I think I hit every single one of them. Uh, but finally we were ready. Uh, we told everybody involved, the old system is retiring, you are moving. Um, we did user training, we announced the migration dates, uh, we worked, had been working with an outside vendor and we got the conversion software from the vendor. And just to make sure that we had enough time to complete this migration, we scheduled this process to happen over a three-day holiday weekend. So I think it's important to, uh, for the story to note at this point that my group didn't run the Exchange servers. There was another separate group within our organization that actually would need to run this conversion process that would turn the Meeting Maker calendars uh, into Exchange calendars. So the other group kicked off the conversion process, which turned the Meeting Maker calendars into PST files. And they then sent us the PSTs and told us to check them out. So we checked the calendars for a couple of our VIPs, and uh, they look good. You know, my colleague on the project said, let's, this looks awesome. Let's just tell the other folks to just you know, kick off the import process, and then let's go home for the weekend, this three-day weekend. It's going to be great. Then I said something. I said, let's check the others. <laughs> so I started opening PSTs and I started importing them into Outlook. And that's when I discovered that if your last name started with uh, the letter A uh, through the letter G, your calendars were great. <laughs> but if your last name started with H through the rest of the alphabet, <laughs> Your calendars were either blank or they had maybe like two things in them that were like, you know, from like 10 years ago. Yeah, just, it's really bad. <laughs> so I tried calling the person who had been running this conversion process and uh, he had departed for the holiday weekend, shocking. Um, tried calling other people in the department. No, 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 I can't do that, can't do that. Oh, I'm heading out the door myself. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> So fortunately, 
thanks to VMware and the fact that we had all the pieces needed to rerun this conversion process ourselves, uh, minus access to the actual Exchange servers, uh, my coworker and I could try to fix this issue ourselves. Uh, the conversion process needed a Windows XP or Vista box, uh, an Exchange 2007 SP1 server, and an Active Directory domain controller. So we stood those up in an isolated test host environment, and then we reran this conversion process. We started on Friday. Late on Saturday night, we finally figured out that one person who had a last name starting with G, she happened to be the last person with a, you know, in, in an alphabetical order, her last name started with G. Uh, she had a problem with her calendar, and that was causing the conversion process to silently fail for everybody past her. So fortunately, this person had departed from our organization, so we didn't have to care about her calendar. <laughs> So we dropped this person from the conversion process. This is where I got to learn you know, fun MySQL commands like drop table. Um, so we reran everything after dropping this person's account from the, uh, the database. Uh, we re-imported all the calendars, and we visually checked each individual calendar to make absolutely certain that everything looked good this time around. And as the sky began to lighten, to announce the arrival of the first day following this long weekend, my coworker and I, who were miraculously still on speaking terms, <laughs> finally got through the last set of calendars and we proclaimed them that they are good. So we contacted our colleagues in the other group who were newly returned from their relaxing long weekend and said, would you please import these PSTs into these folks' exchange accounts? And then I waited to see if anything else was gonna go wrong. Much to my own surprise, nothing really did besides the normal, how do I log in? How do I find X? You know, do I really need to use this new system? Whereupon I shut down my computer, I turned off my phone, and then I went home for some much needed sleep. The end. Thanks so much. No problem. All right. So the good news there is that users were not affected. So that's awesome. Um, that's where testing really helps out. Um, so just show of hands, who in here has made a mistake? <laughs> yeah, those of you who didn't raise your hands, you're lying. Who here has made a mistake, let's say a work-related mistake, just to keep it simple, and immediately afterwards gone, I should have tested that first. All right, so how bad was it? Does anyone have a new job as a result of that? <laughs> All right, so <laughs> you're still in it now. All right, so this is a story of something that happened to me, or more specifically, something I did to everyone else at Fastly. Um, one of the things I like to do is give my users a really easy way to get updated to the latest operating system. And so I put an installer, if they're on a previous version, I put an installer for them in self-service. And since we're Fastly, and we like everything to be really fast, I don't want them to have to wait for the installer to download when they click on it in self-service. So instead what I do is I create a smart group and I identify everyone who's not running, in this case, El Capitan. And I cache the update, uh, the, the upgrade installation to their machine. Uh, there's some checks in there to make sure they're not like, too full on disk space before it happens and you know, some other factors. But for the most part, anyone not running El Capitan is just going to have this installer sitting in their cache waiting, just waiting for them to hit the button in self-service. Everybody with me so far? OK. So this is what my policy looked like. Very simple. We're just caching the combo update. In this case, it was 10.11.3 at the time. And then 10.11.4 came out. And my security team said, 10.11.4 has a very serious security fix, so we cannot have anyone on 10.11.3. So I had to go ahead and delete 10.11.3 from everyone's cache, get 10.11.4 package in there instead, and uh, so on Friday, about 4 o'clock, 
I uploaded the package to the server, and I went ahead to update the smart group logic as well. And then I thought, I'm not going to make a new policy. I'm just going to swap the package in the old policy so I don't make a mistake. And here's what I did. I deleted the package from the policy. So far, so good. I went ahead and looked through our vast collection of packages that we need to clean out and grabbed our 10.11.4. And I saved it. And I went home. <laughs> Did anyone happen to catch my mistake? <laughs> so those of you who are paying attention now notice that I have a policy that is now force installing 10.11.4 on anyone running anything lower. You'll notice I don't have the restart options in there. And that's because I like to pull out the restart options for any policy that doesn't explicitly need them so I don't make a mistake. <laughs> and that worked well for all the policies I created. But then this policy was just sitting there in my JSS from way back in the day when we set it up. And I learned something. It turns out that when you have a package that the JSS has flagged requires reboot, the restart actions in any policy will pick up on that and restart. So we were fine for a couple of days. No one knew what had happened. No one was aware. And then computers started force rebooting and upgrading on Monday morning, and I took the day off. <laughs> and I got a phone call from my boss that was essentially, what the hell is happening? <laughs> you know, he said, someone's, someone's computer, here's how he phrased it to me, someone's computer just rebooted, and now it says it's up, updating OS X. I said, well, that's a little weird. But I thought it was one person, so I wasn't that concerned yet. And I thought, you know what, I'll, I'll log into the JSS and take a look and see what I can find. But I made myself breakfast first. You know, I, was, <laughs> I wasn't in a big rush because I thought it was one computer, and I had some, they should be on El Capitan anyway. And then I got the next phone call. It just happened to three more people. OK, that's weird. So I logged into the JSS and did a little poking around looking at policy logs. And I saw my mistake. And by the time I saw my mistake, it had hit every single computer at Fastly that wasn't already running 10.11.4. There was nothing I could do to stop this. It was happening. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so so I, I called my boss. And I told him, here's what happened. There's literally nothing we can do other than tell people, you may want to reboot your computer the first chance you get, and then go have a cup of coffee while it upgrades so it doesn't happen to you unexpectedly in the middle of something important. And understandably, he wasn't too happy with that. And we got off the phone, and I got on LinkedIn and started looking for new jobs. <laughs> and. Yeah, the next few days was a lot of cleanup. Um, our, we're, we're a very chef-heavy organization. We, we do a lot of work with Chef. And a lot of our users had older versions of Chef that um, lived in uh, user bin or user s bin, which was the, what's the one protected by SIP? Or they're both protected by SIP. They're both protected by yeah, SIP. Not, user local is the good one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. user local is the, the new one that you, can, that you can use. So yeah, Chef had it in one of those two spots, the, the binary. So not only did I upgrade all of our developers to 10.11, and you know how developers are when you just do stuff. They're not happy. Now I broke Chef for them, too. So now we had to you know, send out another communication. Like, yeah, you have to install the latest version of Chef because that puts it in the right location. It was a disaster. Um, and that is actually the event that prompted me to think that it's a really good idea to set up a second JSS, not that that's what I did at Fastly at all. Um, so again, the takeaway here is 
even the most innocuous of change can have very unintended consequences if you're not super careful. So I would encourage you to set up a second JSS or a second monkey server or whatever, whatever you're using. It's just a second one that's completely isolated from any machine that's important to somebody. And test this stuff before you roll it into production. So I've got one more story for you all today. I call this one Breaking the Cloud. This is from my time at Jamf. I was in professional services at Jamf Software. And I was helping a customer migrate their tens of thousands of machines from their on-prem JSS up to Jamf Cloud. Their, their on-prem JSS, they just couldn't keep it running. It was just constantly dying. They didn't really have in-house expertise for, for server management and thought, you know what, we're just gonna, we're gonna move everything to Jamf Cloud and we're gonna start fresh, brand new JSS, we're gonna re-enroll our machines and just completely start over because our JSS is that screwed up. And they brought me in to help with that migration. So, we talked a lot about how we wanted to do it, and I thought the easiest way was just use the existing JSS to enroll everyone into the new JSS. And rather than push out a quick add package, which if, fail, if failed would you know, not try again, um, I decided I'm gonna, I'm gonna get fancy. You know, I know how to script. I'm gonna write a script. I'm gonna write a script to do this for me. So deploy a script down, it unenrolls the machine, enrolls the machine in the new JSS, everything's cool. We test this on a few machines. And within minutes they show up in the cloud JSS, everything's fine. So Friday, you notice a, a, a trend here? <laughs> Read only Friday, that's a good tip. So Friday, end of the day, we say okay, roll this out to everybody. But we had a reason for that. We wanted it to kind of happen over the weekend slowly as you know, people weren't using their computers as much so that we could keep an eye on things and, and turn it off if it got too bad. We thought that was a great plan. And over the weekend we kept an eye on the cloud JSS and everything was fine. Machines were occasionally rolling in, things were happening, everything looked good. So Monday morning comes around, and a lot of you, a lot of you are in education, so you, you, know, you know how Monday mornings can be. Everyone turns on their computer, things start to happen. Uh, so Monday morning, we go to log in to their cloud JSS, and it's not there. And I think, well, that's weird. That's not supposed to happen. It's the cloud. The cloud never breaks. And I went to log into my personal cloud JSS, and I got the same thing. I broke Jamf Cloud. I essentially, I DDoSed Jamf Cloud and brought it down. Um, the online services team at Jamf was not happy with me. Go figure. Um, and they were working tirelessly to get it back up, but it was taking a long time. Um, and I think, I think they ended up getting everyone else's Jamf Cloud up, but ours was still, like, we just couldn't get it up. So like, I think the entirety of Jamf Cloud was only down for a very short time, but this particular instance was just, we couldn't get it back up. And then I remembered something. I put that in my script. Those of you who are not bash gurus, um, this is trying to, re every computer is trying to re-enroll in the JSS every 60 seconds until it's successful. <laughs> Tens of thousands of computers. And I've unenrolled them from the old JSS, so I have no way of stopping this. And so eventually online services determined, like, there's a lot of requests just hammering and hammering and hammering. What, stop doing that. And I, when I realized what, I was, what was happening, I was like, I can't. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you guys, but I can't. I thought ahead. I wanted something that was completely fail safe. And so there's these computers just hammering Jamf Cloud. And I'm, I'm not sure what they did to get it back up. I don't know if they just threw servers at it until it stopped failing or what. But eventually, the, the wizards of the online services team at Jamf Software managed to get Jamf Cloud up and running for this customer and stable enough for the rest of the machines to check in and things to calm down. Um, and then I got a very stern talking to, it was basically, don't ever do that again. <laughs> um, so this instance, I mean, we tested, right? We, we tested on a few machines and it worked. 
We let it run over the weekend, we kept it on, and it worked great. So this is an instance where I don't know that testing would have helped because this was really a problem of scale. But I think the takeaway here is just really think about what you're doing, what the implications are, and, and what un, unseen things may pop up and, and, and bite you. Um, so in, in this case, I don't really have a good answer as to how this could have been avoided other than you know, me trying to be a little less perfect at uh, making sure every machine got in the JSS no matter what happened. Um, so those are the stories I have for you guys. Do we have, okay, great, we have some time. So what I'd like to do, if, if Rich is uh, game, to invite Rich back up and open the floor to any questions you all have about testing. It can be about the situations we talked about or just a, hey, I have, you know, I want to figure out a way to test this thing in my environment. What do you, what do you guys recommend? So does anyone have any questions about testing? So you heard our mistake yesterday um, when we were trying to we were trying to get our labs to behave like 600 students were using them. What would be the best way for us to have pulled that off? Uh, forgive me, I think I was out of the room during your talk working on mine. Fair enough. <laughs> so then. I'm not familiar with your scenario. <laughs> Rich, were you? Um, were you I was there for th for that one, and uh, I mean, really, you would want maybe something. Trying to think if that would apply. I'm trying to think if Sekuli would apply. Um, but I mean, there are ways that you could essentially maybe script something like Chaos Monkey and have it work on your machines and actually log into all 600 machines and have it just you know frantically clicking things mm. and trying to access things and have it set up so that um, it is trying to mount file shares and things like that. But now that I think about it, that might also cause some problems with your file shares. It so sounds maybe. like the Jamf yeah. thing all over again. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, basically, if you want to, if you have the resources to do that kind of full-scale test, then do a full-scale test where you're automating, basically, the, the machines acting up. Um, that's probably the best thing I can recommend. Because otherwise, you... If it's a scale problem, you're not going to see the problem at small scale. Mm. You'll only see it when you hit the scale where you actually have the problem. Yeah. Cool. I was going to say, that can't be the only question about testing we have. Is your dev site an exact replica other than the machines to your prod site? Yes. Do you test as, as close as you can to your prod site? Yes, we test as. Uh, it, it, Mm. I actually can't answer that question. I can answer a question like that, though. <laughs> so I also have a separate uh, JSS. And um, I wish there was another way to keep it more closely in sync. But I do have a separate JSS that periodically I will update the database from my production server, then clear out the machines and re get a push notification certificate and everything else to try to keep my test environment as close to my production environment as possible, except minus machines. Um, like in my production environment, I have like 500, 550, varies around machines, where in my test environment, I've got like six. <laughs> so um, I mean, if I'm testing a scale issue, that's probably the one thing I can't really adequately test for. But other things like testing you know, self-service OS upgrades and that kind of thing, I can do that on my test JSS and not have to worry about screwing up anybody in production. And that's been an enormous weight off my mind. Yeah, so I can talk about what I would do in theory. Hypothetically. Hypothetically, what I've done in the past and what I would do if someone said, hey, you need to design a test environment in our organization. Um, you know, I would design the infrastructure to be identical. Um, so you know, if, you're, if you're in AWS and you're using uh, large instances for your production, Use large instances for your test environment, even though it's overkill, because you know you got to get as close as possible as you can to production to rule out any possible uh, you know differences. Um, I'm also a big fan of taking the production database and importing it into the uh, testing server, so that you have you know similar data in your database. So when you make your smart group queries, you're seeing what would actually happen if you made that query on your production. Instance. Now, there are a few caveats to that. If you're using um, some of the Apple services like 
uh, VPP, DEP, APNS. It's a really, really bad idea to have two different servers using the same certificates for those services, talking to services, especially in the case of VPP. Um, I've seen instances where if you, if you put the same VPP token on two servers and you assign apps on one server, they get assigned to the users, and the other server says, wait a minute, that user's not supposed to have those apps, and yanks them back. And the other server goes, oh, yes, they are, and puts them back on, and they get in this like tug of war. Um, so if you're going to use your production database, um, definitely cleanse it of you know, VPP, DEP, um, APNS, and I'd even go as far as say as set up separate VPP, DEP, um, APNS accounts and certificates for that test environment so that you're still replicating the behavior, but you're not uh, fighting with production. And I'd also say document that procedure because the thing that's going to get you is the one time that you forget to you know, change out that mm -hmm. uh, APNS certificate or that VPP token. If you have a checklist and follow it when you're importing that database and then cleaning up afterwards, that'll save you a ton of trouble. What I would do there, if it were me, hypothetically, is I would create a script to run against MySQL that strips out the specific bits that I need stripped out. That way I know it's always doing the same thing every time and it's not relying on me to go into a GUI and, oh, did I, wait, do I check this box or not? Um, hypothetically speaking, that's what I would probably do. Hypothetically speaking, hypothetically you share speaking, that script or? Uh, uh, let's let's circle back on that later. All right, taking it offline. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, just no questions. Just uh, I have some advice. Uh, what I'm doing to avoid those um, uh, those chaos and disasters. Uh, so normally, when I, after I wrote a script or uh, finish a package, I will wait for like 20 minutes, and I will go back and have a look at it again just give an extra buffer. The second thing is when I'm going to deploy that, I will first go to a, a lab, uh, which is not very busy, just average lab. So a few users using that computers, so I will deploy to that. Then I will scope to a, a busy lab, so many users using the computers. And then I will go to like full scale, like all the, all the schools, all the labs, yeah. So just give extra buffers, you can, you can it's, a, it's a production environment, but a smaller group, smaller mm -hmm. scope, and yeah. So you can find uh, at least it's not a whole breakdown things happening. Yeah. 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 I'm I'm really glad you brought that up because um, I think doing a phased rollout is a really smart way to go about that because it's better to break you know five people's computers than everyone's. Um, it, no, don't start no. with the CEO. Uh, start with your interns or you know your your. Don't mess with yeah. No. Don't mess with payroll or HR in general. Um, or, or you know, the other people on your IT team also would be bad. Well, no, it depends. Maybe, who knows? Uh, but yeah, I, I am a big fan of, of that kind of uh, testing, and also um, having code review. So if you write a script, if you build a package, have someone that isn't you look it over. Just look it over. Just see what they see. I've I've definitely caught things. I, I haven't caught things. Other people have caught things for me just because I said, hey, what do you think of this? So it's always a good idea. And to follow up on that for a code review, one way that um, I've been managing my scripts for the JSS is that uh, Mike Morales actually wrote a really great script for pulling your scripts out of the JSS and storing them locally. So what I did was I run Mike's script uh, for download, he has two of them. One is for downloading extension attributes, and another one is for downloading scripts from your JSS. Nice. And I have them go directly into uh, my local uh, copy of my Git repository for work. And then I commit them. Nice. So basically, it comes back down. I launch source tree. It's like, oh, look, changes. All right. Write the short commit message, hit commit. They go up to our Git server, and that way, if I wanted someone else to take a look at it, um, it's relatively easy. For someone to go, oh, okay, let me pull it up in a web browser, or let me just, you know, bring it down to my own repo. I can take a look at it. That's a really good idea. I like that. I wish there was an easier way to do source control, but this has been a way that I found, and it's, it works pretty well. Yeah, that's. I think that's especially with scripting. That's a big. It's always been a big pain point for for Casper's not having 
source control. So kind of having to roll your own is, is really the best way to do it. Yeah. But it's, it's worth the time and effort because you, you will catch things that you wouldn't otherwise catch. Other questions, comments? Anyone else want to tell a story of a time they really screwed up and almost got fired? <laughs> Come on up. All right. A little bit, a little bit of true confessions. Um, you may have seen the photo I put up on Slack, for some of you. Hammer on a switch with hard reset on it. Um, no, I had one, I, I had one similar to what happened with you, with wildcard, Tor wildcard. The, I, had, I didn't do this, a user who did it with, uh, they're trying to stop um, key loggers. So they did LOG. Mm. <laughs> what could go wrong? Apparently, there's this thing called login window. What? <laughs> but I'm already logged in. I don't need that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, no, I had one. This wasn't actually me personally, but this was a colleague of mine, and I will not reveal his name for his own safety and concern. He was doing the right thing by testing. He was sent out to a site where he wasn't familiar with it, and it was a virtualized mail server. And all he had to do was there had some issues, and there was an update available. And I was the primary engineer for that customer, but I've been called away. So as I listen, here's the steps. Um, there is a backup already running of the database and everything's like that. You just have to literally log on to here, run the update, everything should be fine. Again, there's that keyword there of should. Um, but he was still, he was very cautious and he really believed in testing. So he wanted to take a VM snapshot just in case. Like he didn't necessarily trust what the system was running because the backup was on the same server. So he ran a VM snapshot. What he didn't do was check how big the VM was and where the destination was going to and how much free space there was. So that panicked itself. And so he panicked as well and clicked cancel. But what he actually clicked was delete. Oh. <laughs> This was a financial organization, I should say. Oh. They need email every second. Um, so I get a few phone calls. Um, and my phone's on silent because I'm dealing with a customer and I can't really be answering my phone sort of thing like that. And it's just ringing nonstop. I'm like, sorry, I, th I think something might be on fire as a joke. Yeah. Oh, something is on fire. OK. Um, <laughs> I, uh, they, I'm, long story short, like, I managed to get them back. They lost a day of mail. Uh, on the bright side, I did manage to convince them to buy a proper backup solution. <laughs> <laughs> but that was something I just wanted to add on to that in terms of the testing. That was a guy who was very cautious. He really wanted to make sure that he had everything ready in case something caught on fire. It was just coming down to the checklist, making sure there's always that, that just one little bit that you didn't think of doing. Because on a backup, yeah, there's plenty of room. Not always. So that's just something I thought I'd add into it. Thank you. Very, very informative. <laughs> uh, got another one over here. Cool. Yeah. A few, few years back, um, for I was at Jamf, I was working for a reseller. I was in a school. I was uh, cleaning up some labs during the holidays, uh, and I was lazy. And I sent out a policy that was basically a rm slash users just to clean up the home directories that were floating around um, and instead of actually when i scoped that policy this is where i got really lazy um, or I, I lost situational awareness i think was the term <laughs> I, used. Uh, I, I just did a smart group and said like the prefix for that lab and said everything matching or, or the name starts with these three letters then go and run that and of course there was a teacher whose name of his machine did actually match that and I blew away his home directory. So um, wasn't smart. We didn't do much more work for that school <laughs> after that. <laughs> to, but the nice thing was that their IT department actually blamed him and told him he was meant to have a backup himself. So it was they kind of blamed it on him because um, <laughs> they didn't like him because he was a complete. Uh, he was he was not a very nice person. So it kind of came back to bite him. But in turn, that IT department were obviously not very happy with me, so. Um, my fault. So, 
so while we're running up there, um, I do want to share one more. I just I just remembered um, a long time ago in my one of my very first IT jobs, a coworker of mine gave me a script to run, um, and uh, he swears there was no malicious intent, uh, but he gave me the script to run, and it was it was very long, and said you know I've got comments in there to you know where you need to put certain things and fill things out, and included in that script was this. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, it's good. It's a comment. It won't run. So guess who didn't see that? And guess who spent the rest of the day rebuilding a Linux server? So yeah, also don't do things like that. That's real not, not cool. Yes, that's on my GitHub. You can download it today. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so we have one up here, yes? Yeah, so I've got a story again about an ex-colleague who I used to supervise occasionally and do some work with. Um, and he was trying to do the right thing. He had a VM, and he was trying to package up some software. So he's built the software on his VM using uh, Composer, Snapshot, did some clean out, and his user was whatever his username was. So he kind of built it, and was like, yep, it's all good. Got the package, tested it on his machine. And was like, yeah, that's fine, it works, it installs the software. And then, was like, okay, that's all good. We're gonna deploy this out to every kid in the school. One thing he left in was his keychain and fill user templates. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, come back, oh yeah, kids can't log in, and uh, what's going on? And so he was doing the right thing by trying to test, but not test far enough. And again, he was new at this point, so probably should have uh, got to it before he rolled it out. But yeah, that's just a small story. I've got many others. <laughs> Reasons why we drink, yes. Uh, I think that's all the time we have for this. Um, thank you all very much for, for listening and laughing at my dumb jokes. Um, if you have any other testing questions or want to trade more stories of horrible things, uh, just come find me. And I guess at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Rich for his final talk.